Okay, guys, let's get started. It's nine o'clock. So, Sami, Mustafa, and I would like to thank all of you for uh, turning up to the Extreme Classification Workshop this year. And, uh, well, thanks also for turning up at 9 a.m. So, we have a really busy uh, schedule, a packed schedule, and actually a really great agenda today, which you can see over there. Uh, and uh, it would be great to give Thorsten, who's going to deliver the opening keynote, a rousing welcome. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to mention uh, two things. Uh, first, I wanted to draw your attention to the Extreme Classification Repository. Uh, Thorsten, if you could just switch. So, uh, we've released the repository which contains a lot of um, data sets. Uh, you have data sets ranging from uh, like data sets with hundreds of labels to things which have three million labels. Uh, there's a lot of uh, metadata available about what the labels are, what the features are, what the uh, raw data looks like, etc. So if you want to visualize how good your predictions are. Uh, we've also uploaded lots of different code for lots of different algorithms, which you can just download and try out. Um, there are also metrics and uh, results uh, that we've uploaded and scripts to compute those metrics. So if you want to start playing around in this area, uh, the repository might be a good place for you to uh, start at, look at, and, 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 and if you want to contribute code, data sets, algorithms, uh, please let me know or let any of us know. I'd be happy to upload your results or your data sets and code over there. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is just uh, briefly reflect upon the state of the field today. Right? So when we started this area about uh, three years ago, uh, as, if I look at it today, there's a real explosion, right? So th there are workshops being organized every year. Uh, most of them are very well attended. Uh, there will be papers being published, not just at ICML and NIPS, but also KDD, WWW, Wisdom, and other conferences. Uh, people are doing PhDs in the area. But the most concrete measure of progress that I can see is that when we started three years ago, if you take a benchmark data set, uh, data set such as Wikipedia, precision at one was 20%. Today in this workshop, we'll be presenting pa papers where you get precision and want to be 65%. So what I'm really hoping is that in the workshop, we'll have lots of great ideas presented. Some of them hopefully will stimulate you into thinking about other things. And maybe next time when we meet next year, we'll be able to be more than like 75% P on, on Wikipedia. So that's all I wanted to mention. Um, the opening talk is going to be given by Thorsten. Uh, Thorsten is so famous that he needs no introduction, right? So, I mean, if you don't know Thorsten, you're probably not only in the wrong room, but also in the wrong uh, conference, probably in the wrong city. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, welcome Thorsten and uh, give him a rousing welcome. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Monik. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. And... Uh, and the opportunity to speak here. Um, so what I want to talk about is a connection between extreme classification and the problems that I often work on, which are problems of learning from implicit feedback. And I think where these two meet is that we have to deal with incomplete data and partial labels. And let me explain what I mean by this. So, Let's do multi-label classification or label ranking, just to keep things simple for now. And um, I think what we typically assume is that we have, let's say, full information feedback. What I mean by this is for a given input x, we would have this big vector, bit vector, of what are the actual labels that should be attached to this x. So for example, if x is a document, uh, the, the label vector could be the tags that are assigned to this document. So for example, you know, is it about politics? Is it about Europe? Is it about the US? And then based on this kind of ground tools, full information feedback, we would then make a prediction, maybe predict a ranking of these tags, or maybe predict a subset of these tags, something like that, right? Um, and I think, you know, this kind of setup comes up um, not only in like document tagging, it's in object recognition, and it's also in search, right? So in search, x would be a query that you type in. And the kind of ground truth label vector would be, is URL 1 relevant to this? Is URL 2 relevant to this? Is URL you know, for all billions of documents on the web, right? So where's the problem here? Well, the problem is that we almost never get this full information feedback. We'll always have to 
kind of deal with missing data or missing labels annotations. And I think we can have missing label annotations at least in two ways. The first one, which is maybe a little bit more benign, is that we're missing, we, we know what we don't know, basically. So on the, on the left here, these are all of the label vectors for all of the examples, kind of row by row stacked on top of each other. And left would be the full information. On the right, you know, you see these question marks. And the question marks mean, I, you know, I actually don't know whether this label, this hasn't been judged, right? So, you know, for the top left, we know it's not relevant. The next one, we don't know. Um, it's unjudged, not relevant, unjudged, relevant, relevant, and so on. So this is kind of the setting that you may have in a movie recommendation system, where the, the ones and zeros are maybe star ratings, right? Um, it's a complicated setting. Um, it would be easy if these these question marks would be uniformly distributed and, uh, at random, right? But they're typically not. Like in movie recommendation, we know that people tend to rate the movies that they like much more often than the ones that they don't like. So you have to meet, deal with these kind of biases. And uh, we had an ICML paper dealing with this. But I don't think this is actually the problem that we have in extreme classification. The problem that we have in, in extreme classification is maybe a little bit harder at first glance. It's the positive only feedback, right? And in a sense, we don't even know where we are missing information. So there are these red zeros on the right here, and the red zero means, it could mean two things. It could mean this label is not relevant, but it could also mean, well, it hasn't been judged, right? So for example, in the document classification or the document tagging example, there may be some labels, there's millions of labels that could be attached, or millions of tags, but maybe that particular annotator didn't even know all of them, right? So these red zeros and the white zeros, we typically can't distinguish. We can't distinguish whether it's missing or whether it's actual negative feedback. Now, that is exactly the same problem that we have when learning from implicit feedback, let's say, in web search. So here, you know, we present a ranking to the user, and we want to learn from clicks. And we'll, let's say a click indicates relevance. So we see a click on the first document. So we know that there is a one there for that particular document. But let's say the fifth document down here, right? Did the user not click on it because it was not relevant? Or did the user not click on it because the user didn't go that far down? Right? So there's, there's ambiguity here. So what we've been working on are these kind of learning problems from implicit feedback, um, which I think have, you know, at, at, at the level of, you know, the type of feedback that you have are actually very similar to extreme classification problems. And that's what I want to talk about in this talk. So let's start from the beginning. How do we typically do learning to rank now from full information feedback? Well, we would define a loss function. So for, you know, for particular ranking Y, for, for a query X, and these kind of full information relevance annotations R, let's, for the simplicity of this talk, let's say our loss function is the average rank of the relevant document. So there's something that we want to minimize. Re the relevant document should be far to, the, to position one. And this is just a formula to write this down. Um, then what we would kind of like our system to do is our system S should produce rankings Y that in expectation have low loss. And our strategy for learning would be empirical risk minimization. We take the, um, you know, um, we estimate the risk on a, um, on a sample of queries and annotations and minimize the empirical risk. So very straightforward in that sense. So what are we going to do with partial information learning to rank now? So let me set the stage for that. So let's say Y bar is the ranking that we actually presented to the user, and that now biases where we see relevance feedbacks, right? where we see actually uh, labels being annotated. <clears throat> then there's a random process in the background that tells us now, and these are the random variables OI, for each particular document, are we observing the true label or are we missing it? So OI is a binary random variable that tells us whether the, the relevance rating is observed or not. 
typically we can't observe it. CI is now click, and click, let's say, directly corresponds to, to relevance, as we said, um, as it's here in this equivalence here. So if something is clicked, then it must have been observed, and it must be relevant, and vice versa, if something is relevant and observed, people will click. You can introduce noise here, but let's keep it simple for, um, for now. So what's the crucial part now? Um, since we can't observe O, uh, whether something is observed, um, the crucial piece will be to reason about the probability that something is observed, which we call the propensity. So let's assume that we actually know for every example, for every query, and every label, we know the probability that we will see that label being annotated or this document being annotated. So for example, in the, in the top left here, it means there's a 10% chance for that document that um, uh, the user will actually reveal through clicking um, or not clicking, the true relevance label. And 90% of the time, the user will not. It's the marginal probability of, of seeing the relevance label. And so this so is 90% for the first one. And for the last one, maybe that was the one ranked in position number one. Uh, we would actually see the true label was 50%. And we, let's say we actually know this matrix of propensities for all queries and, um, and all labels or all documents. So what can we do with this now? Well, with this, we can actually define an unbiased estimator of our loss. And it's actually very simple. Um, so even though we don't know the full relevance vector R for any particular um, example or any particular query, what we can do is we can divide um, rank or you know, uh, rank times relevance divided by the propensity of actually observing this. And if you, you know, spend three lines of math, you will see that this is an unbiased estimator of the true loss that we would get if we actually know the complete relevance vector. And what's particularly nice is that um, you know, if something is observed, um, the relevance label is just 0 or 1. So really, we just need to sum over the observed and relevant documents. And we've just said that these are the clicked documents. So really, what we only need to sum over is what's the rank of the click document divided by the propensity that we're observing this click. And so we actually don't need to know where the question marks are right, to, estimate, to, uh, to compute this, esti this unbiased estimator. So that's very nice. And of course, if you have an unbiased estimate for each individual loss and for each individual query, we can just sum all of these up and we get an unbiased estimator of the, you know, the, uh, of the risk. So our empirical risk that we're going to be optimizing in, um, 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 in, in this talk is something of this form, where we're now um, taking all of these unbiased loss estimates and getting an overall unbiased estimate of the risk. So this is very standard kind of inverse propensity scoring um, that you maybe have seen also in covariate shift or in, in other, or batch learning from Bennett feedback and other problems to debias your data. Now there are two problems left, right? First is how do we actually optimize this type of a risk? And the second one is how do we define this propensity model and estimate the propensities? Let's start with the first one. And here I'm going purely by convenience. Um, and the, uh, kind of in the context of ranking SVMs, there's a very simple way of just including these propensities in the ranking SVM and, um, and kind of ba basically inheriting most of the nice properties that you have for ranking SVMs as well. But you could do this for many other learning algorithms, um, I assume, as well. So let's rewrite the data that we get in the following way. So we have these tuples where we see query, which document was clicked, what are the other documents in this um, that were not clicked? And what's the propensity of this click? And then you write this as this big uh, quadratic program where you have a constraint that says every click document should be ranked higher than an unclicked document. That's violated. You incur some slack. And it's very easy to see that the sum of the slacks for each example is an upper bound on the rank of the relevant document. So what you see in the objective here um, is exactly the risk estimate, that we had, the unbiased risk estimate that we had on the previous slide, but you're optimizing an upper bound on it. 
just like what you always do in SVM. So convex up to bound. So this all is a convex up, um, quadratic program. So you're, you're minimizing an upper bound on the unbiased risk estimate, and you regularize it in the SVM style. But again, you can probably do this for many other learning algorithms as well. I just happen to have code for this one. OK, that was the first. So we can actually optimize these kind of unbiased um, empirical risks uh, if effectively. The second one is um, now coming up with a propensity model and estimating it. And again, so far we've just taken the very simplest choice that you could possibly take. We said, OK, the it's a position-based model that's kind of standard in information retrieval, but we're using it in a non-standard way. So what it says is the probability of a click is the probability that somebody actually looks at this document times the probability that if somebody looks at it, the person will click. That's basically what this, uh, this top line says. And now we're assuming that the probability of somebody looking at the document depends entirely on rank. So the probability that somebody goes to rank number five, there is a particular number, Q5, that tells you what this probability is. So, and then the, the, the second part, <clears throat> Um, whether somebody clicks on it, we assume that this is deterministic, but you can also assume uh, you can put a noise model in there as well. So if you now think about it, this first part, the probability that somebody actually observes a certain document, is exactly now the propensity that we, that we need. Right? It's the probability that this, uh, this will be, uh, um, the true relevance label will be revealed. So what we need to do now is to estimate propensities, we need to estimate all of these QRs, right? But that's only a small number, right? It's one number for each rank in this very simple model. Of course, you can have more complex models. Now, how do we do that? Well, we could get annotated data and do eye tracking studies on people or stuff like that, but you can actually do this much more simply uh, through a simple intervention experiment. What you can do is <clears throat> you can take um, for a small, small subset of the queries, you can take the top, let's say the top ranked results, you can do this for any result, and randomly swap it with some position below. So let's say you would randomly pick position number four and now swap it in position number four. Now you can, so the, the quality of the document, no, is, is still the same quality as, you know, it's a typical quality of what you normally put in position number one. But you now put it in position number four, now you can kind of estimate what's my decrease in click rate. And since the quality of the document is the same in expectation, the only reason for a decrease in click rate would be basically that the QR for position four is by this factor lower. So you can estimate what's the ratio between Q1 and position Q, uh, QK at position, let's say, 4, just by looking at what's the click rate before the intervention or without the intervention and with the intervention. You don't, and, and it's actually enough to just know these ratios, right? Because if you look at the previous SVM rank problem there, um, everything is scale invariant. So you don't actually know the absolute value. You just need to, have to, need to know the relative values of these Qs between, uh, between different Qs. So this is a very cheap way of actually estimating the, this propensity model. You don't actually have to do like eye tracking studies in people and see how far they go down. Okay, so let's look at um, some synthetic experiments first and then do a, um, uh, see some, some uh, real world experiment on a search engine afterwards. So for the synthetic experiments, um, we took the Yahoo web search data set, which is a full information data set. A lot of money has been spent on annotating, um, you know, the relevant documents here. And um, the way that we're now generating synthetic click data is we're taking a production ranker, which is a kind of mediocre ranking function that we cooked up. Rank, you know, produce these Y bars, these rankings that we present to the user, to our synthetic user here. And then people now click according to our position-based propensity model. You know, they go down the ranking up to a certain position, uh, and the, the QRs 
um, you know, whether they look at something in position number 10, uh, we picked here one over the rank, um, and then there's a parameter eta that you can pick to make this drop off faster or you can make it slower, right? Uh, eta equals zero means there's no drop off, you know, and the higher you put it, the, the steeper the propensities decay. Um, so typically we set eta equal to one just for these experiments. Um, so here's the first set of results. And on the x-axis, you have the number of training clicks. It goes from uh, roughly 1,000 to a million. And on the y-axis, you have performance, so average rank of the relevant documents. Um, so lower is better. So this dashed line on the top there, that's our production ranker. That's the ranker that was used to present rankings, that, um, to, to present the rankings that kind of drew the clicks. And it's pretty crummy. The bluish line on the bottom here is, um, so that's our skyline. That's if you give the full information, the, the complete full information Yahoo data set to, SV, to a ranking SVM, standard ranking SVM, train it, optimize it, that's the performance that you get. So that's kind of the best that we can hope to achieve. Okay, so let's now compare kind of a naive ranking SVM that ignores these biases and doesn't do any propensity scoring or weighting um, to, one, to the one that I've just proposed. So the naive one is this green line. And what you can see is it actually gets pretty good performance even with a small amount of data. But since it's, it's optimizing a biased risk, if you give it more and more data, it doesn't actually improve. Right? So the biased risk that it's using to, to select ranking functions, um, you know, it, you, you, by giving it more and more data, you just more and more accurately estimate the wrong risk. Basically, all of your prediction error is due to bias here, right? You're optimizing the wrong thing. The red curve that starts at the top there that is the propensity weighting, weighted ranking SVM. That's unbiased. And it's truly unbiased here because we actually know what the propensity model was. And it actually starts out a little worse um, than the naive one. But it eventually, if you give it enough data, it converges to the skyline. Right? So here, the issue is not bias, but it's variance. And if you do propensity weighting, you're actually you're making the variance of your learning algorithm worse in return for having no bias. But of course, if you have more and more and more and more data, your variance eventually goes down. So if you're in a big data regime, really bias is the thing that you really want to avoid. right? And that's what this uh, propensity weighting does. You can, you know, the, 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 the one thing that, that fascinates me the most is that you actually have a new bias variance trade-off that's even inherent in your risk estimate meter here. And you don't have in fully supervised full information learning. In particular, you can now kind of tweak also your propensity model to control bias and variance. Maybe you introduce a little bit of bias in return for much lower variance. And that's what this slightly lower curve at the beginning is here, where you kind of clip propensities um, to make the propensity weights not get too large. And that also helps, you know, you're introducing some bias in return for lower variance, um, and that helps for low data routines. But I think there's probably much smarter ways of doing this. Um, the second experiment um, where we vary the, the severity of this presentation bias. Um, so this is this ADA parameter on the, um, on the x-axis here. If you have no presentation bias, you're basing your full information setting, naive and propensity weighting do the same thing. If you increase presentation bias, um, the bias of the naive method gets worse. The propensity weighted SVM also gets worse, but it's not due to bias, it's due to variance. Right? And if you add more data, that's the lower curve. Um, again, you can, you can uh, get rid of, this, of the variance. Let me briefly talk about the real work experiment as well. So we're running the archive full text search. So if you go to archive and do full text search there, that's actually us, it's the system. And we've instrumented the system to do learning. Um, so for this particular experiment, um, we first did this kind of swapping experiment to estimate the propensity model, to estimate these QRs for each rank. 
And we did this on a few hundred queries. You don't need a whole lot of data because you're not estimating that, um, that much there. Then we took a few weeks of click data from our search engine. Now there are no interventions in there. And then trained a naive ranking SVM and this propensity weighted ranking SVM. Um, and then to do the evaluation, we did uh, interleaving. It's uh, by now a standard technique where you can tell whether one ranking function is better than another. And the, basically how it works, if you have two rankings and you want to decide which one is better, you kind of interleave them like this. And then you, you check whether the user clicks on more results from this ranking function or more results from that ranking function. Um, so if you now do this interleaving and compare the propensity weighted ranking SVM learned ranking function against the production ranking function, you see down in the table here, um, it wins by a large margin. Um, so people prefer the, uh, the results by a large margin. Same thing if you now compare the naive ranking SVM with the propensity weighting ranking SVM. The margin is a little bit smaller, but again, people um, greatly prefer the, uh, the results from the propensity weighted ranking SVM. So we, we now actually switched over to this learned model. We're not using this old production model anymore. We're using this one in the ranking SVM, uh, in, the, in the archive full text search. And I hope you'll get better results this way when you go there next time. And I want to point out that, you know, by no means do we believe that our propensity model is the correct model here, or it's a particularly good model. But it's better than this really naive model of assuming that there is no presentation bias. Right? So I think it's actually a very forgiving problem. The, the, the bar to beat is really low in a sense. Okay, so let me wrap up. Um, so I talked about this partial information learning to rank problem. Um, and it's a problem that I think we typically try to ignore and we assume that we have full information, but you can actually really embrace the fact that you have partial information and still do very effective learning with this, if you just recognize that this is what's going on. And it's somewhere between this kind of batch learning from bandit feedback and the full information case. Uh, I think it's relevant actually to a lot of learning problems because whenever we have complex labels, we have to think about the cost of actually making sure that we're, do we really want to spend all of this money to get close to the full information case or do we kind of embrace the partial information case and, you know, just live with the fact and do, make, you know, make well-founded use of the fact that you know, it's just partially annotated. Uh, what I proposed is this empirical risk minimization approach where we have an unbiased ERM um, objective or a debiased ERM objective despite the biased partial feedback. And this one ranking SVM method, but again, I think there, that can be done for many other uh, methods as well. So open questions. Um, as I said, so what I think what fascinates me both is, most is that there is a new kind of bias variance trade-off that we don't have in full information learning. We can now kind of select how biased do we want our risk, empirical risk to be, and how do we trade off the, the, the bias of this estimator against the variance of this estimator. And in, in a sense, the naive one is all bias, the propensity weighted one is all variance, but the, the optimum must be somewhere in between. And I think there's interesting techniques to explore there. Or even, even the question of whether the, 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 there are many ways of debiasing actually the, uh, once we have propensities, there are many ways of debiasing the empirical risk. Um, and this inverse propensity weighting is probably not the best one as well. So I don't know. Um, there's also the question of how do we actually do propensity estimation and modeling? Um, it's not your prediction problem. The, um, we never actually predict anything here. We're just trying to assign probabilities to actions that happened in the past. That's not our typical kind of machine learning problem either. Um, other loss function, other algorithms, and other applications. So thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, 
Right. So the, right, so the propensity model, how we define it right now, um, is definitely dependent on what's the production ranker that predicts the, um, that proposes the rankings, right? Yes, that's one. Um, I think more generally, this assumption that the marginal probabilities of observing that the person goes to a certain position uh, is, de depends only on rank is also a pretty bold assumption, let's put it this way, right? Um, so, when, but one could use other click models, like kind of cascade style models, DBN type of models, um, that would also give you propensities, um, and that are now also conditioned on what are the relevances of the other results. Um, so I think, yes, in this uh, kind of how do we model propensities, um, I think there is a, there's a huge space of, uh, of, of things that you can probably do better than what we've done here. I think we're going to stop uh, so that we can keep on schedule. So let's uh, thank Thorsten again. Thank you. Thank you.